Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick. And I'm Elizabeth. And today on the show, we've got Robert Dubach, whose new show, The Book of Moron, you heard that right, which is touring the United States. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Before we get to Bob, I have a story to tell you. My sister-in-law, Amy, I'm going to call you out, uh, she's always fun. She's the life of the party. But Amy is a little scatterbrained at times. Okay. So we went to a movie with the kids. And I have to say, Marcus Theaters here in the Wisconsin area, I don't know if all theaters are like this now, but they have assigned seating. Yes. Thank and goodness. I, I love it. Because you can show up right at showtime, miss the previews, even show up 10 minutes late because you know the yeah. previews are going to go, and not have to worry about not having a seat when you get there, especially if you have a large group. So we brought my two kids, her three kids, uh, one of our nieces, and then we had four adults okay. also going to the show. So we had a lot of seats that we were taking up. So we get our popcorn and our drinks, and we're towing seven kids with us and all this stuff. So we get in the theater, and we go to the top row where we got our seats because the baby likes to run around. Well, he's not, but he's like two. Okay. He likes to run around. So we give him some space where he's not going to bother people. So we go up to this, the, the thing, and of course, you get people that are not sitting in their seats. Oh, I hate that. Right. Now, the whole rest of the row was open. So it, quote, shouldn't have mattered because maybe people wouldn't show up. But what if they show up uh, five minutes into the movie and then you have to do all this readjusting and all this stuff? Right. Well, of course, this guy's sitting in my seat. Oy. And so it's my problem to deal with. So everybody's settling in and I'm just like, I could just go down to the other end, but I didn't want to have a problem later. So I was like, sir, I, you're in our seats and it shouldn't matter, but it might. So can we just resolve this? And he goes, well, I have my ticket stub from this seat. And I said, well, that, so do I. I mm -hmm. said, and he pulls it out and he's got it. And I was like, well, let me, let me just take a look. As soon as I went to touch his ticket stub, he grabbed it away and he says, don't you take my ticket stub. <gasps> And I was like, I just wanted to compare it to see. Now, let me be clear. This is a kid's movie, right? Because you've got a bunch of kids. <laughs> is this an old, a man by himself? No, it was a man and his wife. They were like 50s-ish. Uh, it was Boss Baby. They were showing it as a the part of the kids series. Okay. You know, they bring back old movies yeah, that yeah. you can go, to go for like three bucks or something. Okay. So he grabs his ticket away and I was like, wow. I said, sir, you don't have to be like that. And he's just all like grumbling and all this stuff. I'm like, whatever. So I just go down and sit. Then my sister-in-law comes down to my end of the row and says, we're in the wrong theater. <gasps> I was like, are you serious? Yeah. So not only did we have this encounter with this guy who I was refusing to sit by, I was like done with this dude. Um, we were in the wrong theater. So we had to walk we had to trail all these seven kids and us past this guy. And he's like, oh, he's trying to tell me I'm in the wrong seat and he's not even in the right theater. I was like, oh thank you, God. Amy, for making that happen to me. Oh, that stinks. <laughs> Unbelievable. Who knew that they were going to show it in two theaters? All right, then. Anyway, it kind of ruined my morning. But once we were out of there, I was... I was better. But um, if I had to sit there the whole time with that guy, oh, oh yeah. no. I mean, I did feel bad, but he didn't have to react like right. that. Right. And actually, if he'd let you see the ticket, you might have figured out you were in the wrong theater right away. My point exactly. Yeah. I would have saw the difference on the stub right away. Yes. Anyway. Um, all right. We're going to get into this show. Uh, just a quick reminder before we do. Uh, we are on Twitter now at Fan Counters Live. You can follow our Instagram at Fan Counters Live. Of course, we're on Facebook. So... Uh, join us there, and if you want to email us, you can do it at hello at fancounters.com. Uh, this was another show, Elizabeth, where unfortunately I did without you. Yes. You have work during the day. I work from home. It's it's very easy for me to do some of these yes. uh, shows. So this is one where you will not hear Elizabeth. We are very sad. Yeah, I'm, I'm sad because I kind of wanted to hear about it, but I'll listen to it once you have it all done. There you go. All right, so today on the show, Robert Dubach has a show. It's called The Book of Moron. It's touring the United States and comes to our hometown of Milwaukee, April 13th and 14th at the Marcus Center. Between now and then, you can catch Bob in San Jose, Sarasota, and Charlotte. After the Milwaukee show, he'll go to Nashville and Tampa. Bob isn't just a quick-witted, smart comedian. He also appears in films and television and stays up late at night creating new shows to entertain audiences around the world. His DVD, The Male Intellect, an oxymoron, can be purchased on Amazon. 
However, for some reason, Amazon calls it inside the male intellect. Hopefully that doesn't make it any less funny. No. So go search for it on Amazon. Support Bob. And if you're in any of those cities we mentioned, see the show. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters, the podcast. You need to come to Hollywood, I'm going to make you famous. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. And they pull out of their backpack dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures of my face and tell me to sign all of them. Are you kidding me? I continually will get stopped. Can I take a picture? We're gonna. Oh my god! I definitely decline signing body parts. Oh, I don't want to go there. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. <laughs> that's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're gonna last on the air very long. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Welcome to Fan Counters. Glad you could join us today. Well, thanks for having me. As I mentioned in our opening, you're currently on tour with a couple of shows, but the one that's about to hit Milwaukee, among several mm-hmm. other U.S. cities, is The Book of Moron. And I can't be the only person who, when reading the title of your show, read The Book of Mormon <laughs> on the first pass. So I'm just kind of wondering, is the title of the show meant to play off that mistake, or am I the moron that you're talking about? A little bit of both. Oh, you know, okay. it's, it's an equal opportunity offender. So, um, yes. It is called the Book of Moron. If you think it's the Book of Mormon, then the title applies specifically to you. And if you, I mean, the show is about stupidity. Now, obviously, you can't call people stupid, you know, because people don't like to be called stupid. Because, I mean, it's like Mark Twain said, you know, never get in an argument with a stupid person because you'll lose. He's had more experience. You want to um, try to at least, um, you know, uh, identify what the show's all about, which is. You know, the difference between truth and illusion, smart and stupid. I mean, we all have to, you know, admit that we're fallible. So, and this does it in a humorous way. Well, it's best to let people figure out that they are stupid without you having to tell them. Yeah, I mean, if they admit it to themselves, then, you know, maybe we would, uh, we'd all get along a little better. But uh, it's, uh, the ti- it does help to have the title like that. I mean, it was... Ironically, the hardest thing in, in doing these kind of shows is finding titles that people can, you know, me- immediately get attracted to. Well, and talk about um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So much like stand-up comedy, The Book of Moron is a one-man show, but mm-hmm. how does it differ from traditional stand-up? Well, it's not just a guy on stage with a microphone. Um, it's not really storytelling like The Moth. I mean, I'm my, what I've been doing for the past 20 years, because uh, I used to do a lot of stand-up comedy, and at the time, you know, let's let's go dial this back a few years. Uh, you know, when we stand up comedy kind of went through a resurgence and a, and a rebirth back in the uh, uh, mid seventies to late seventies to through the eighties, and there weren't a lot. There were comedy clubs popping up, you know, and it was an alternative to the old fashioned Ed Sullivan, you know, Catskills, Vegas type of uh, venues. Uh, I used to open up for rock and roll bands, and then comedy clubs would uh, pop up, and I'd work as a headliner at comedy clubs. But there weren't that many of us. You know, now it seems like, you know, every barista is a is a comedian, uh, and it um, it's difficult to be very specific and to be and to stand out because there are so many of uh, people becoming comedians right. or have become comedians. So I kind of saw that, the writing on the wall, probably in the mm, early 90s, and started uh, writing these shows that were, it's kind of a, a combination, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with uh, <laughs> Lily Tomlin and Mark Twain. Oh, sure. So it's real smart humor, and I do, I perform a lot of characters too. So when, you're on, when I'm on stage, it's basically me being a bunch of other people trying to figure out an overall cultural problem. Uh, I've been in Milwaukee a few times with my first show. It's called The Male Intellect, an oxymoron. Uh, and it was about, you know, a guy trying to figure out relationships and, you know, what women want and, you know, how he can grow up and, you know, become more mature. Uh, and it's, it still is pretty much an evergreen. It still tours all over the, all over the world, actually. It's been translated into different languages. So it's, um, it resonates with people because... Uh, and the difference of this, all of this coming back around, uh, the difference of it and being stand-up is that, you know, it's it's still a fictional story. It's not this kind of uh, personal memoir 
which to be honest with you, I hate those kind of uh, solo shows where somebody talks about, you know, being, I don't know, growing up uh, as an immigrant or as a okay. uh, abused by an alcoholic or, I mean, it's, those shows are fine if you're famous because people want to know about your history. But if you're just some average schmo like you and me, nobody really cares because they got their own problems. They all they all have their own alcoholic problems sure. and mm-hmm. parents and things like that. Uh, so I try to make it more of a universal theme or issue. So in the first show, it's about trying to figure out what women want. In this show, The Book of Moron, is trying to figure out the difference between you know, truth and illusion. And Lord knows we're... Uh, <laughs> right smack dab in the middle of the problem right now i watch a lot of clips of the show that were available online and the word offended mm-hmm. seems to be used a lot do you think people are hyper offended these days it depends which side you take you know it's the here the difference between the tr- truth has two sides it it's funny and it hurts now it hurts when it happens to you but when it happens to somebody else it's funny so <laughs> as long as you mm-hmm. can deflect that um i think people have lost the 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 main um in the show the main kind of theme is that we have to hold on to two opposing thoughts simultaneously Mm -hmm. i mean the moment of truth is between is when both of those things are true now we certainly have a disparity of that going on in the country today um and you know the show is not just about politics it's about religion race the media it's about everything that people try to pile up under their own little echo chamber and force that onto everybody else. Well, all that is is just a collision. So, yeah, sure, they're going to get offended. But when, luckily, if you use humor the right way, people can laugh at what they're offended at and look at it from a different perspective and hopefully realize they're being a little ridiculous and, you know, trying to demand what they're trying to demand. Sure, and we've always said, and this has come up with so many guests, just being able to see both sides, respect both sides, and at least know that there's yeah. reasoning for another opinion. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, it, it's it's a fine line when you say respect both sides. I mean, you, you, you're not respecting when you're making fun of them. So, uh, but you're able to understand the absurdity of somebody who's got their feet so dug into the ground that they uh, they can't. You know, make a <laughs> right. make a different choice. I mean, a friend of mine has a timely old joke. He says, you know, a moderate in the Middle East is someone who only holds, only holds a grudge for seven generations. <laughs> you know, you have to get these. You, you know, it's it's just a, this tribal instinct and ability, or, or in necessity, in order to give ourselves some identity, is ruining us. Now, you but you know, and now we're getting, we're in a serious conversation about something that's extremely funny, which always happens when you talk about comedy. You start dialing in and trying to say, okay, let's, how does this work? Well, it's not a funny explanation. You have to come really see the show, and because uh, it's kind of a nonstop laugh fest. You have a knack also for involving the audience in your shows. So, have you always been comfortable with improv? Yes and no. I mean, it's it's comfortable when I'm in my own uh, arena. So when I'm on stage, but this, that's just basically crowd work because, you know, it, it happens all the time where there's something, you know, that's what's great about live theater. So you never know what's going to happen. I've had, I mean, I think one of your questions you want to get to later on in this was, you know, what kind of fan uh, instances I've had, but something even more so than that. I've had people collapse, you know, and had to be taken out in stretchers from a heart attack or, you know, oh you think gosh. somebody's dying or somebody, you know, and you have to be, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> in retrospect, it's funny and you're able to make it funny. Um, or I was able to make it in a few instances that it happened, uh, uh, from the stage. It could, but it's what you have to be is you have to be authentic so that everybody's at ease and they're comfortable. Um, I'm not that good at improvisation with a bunch of, uh, you know, hey, you know, the, the improv games that you see with three or four other people. Oh, on okay, stage. sure. Like the acting games. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's I mean, th- those are great exercises and I use those in order to write. Um, but uh, that's a different kind of skill, but it's also a different genre, too, that, you know, the, the audience knows that, you know, they're in an unscripted format. I criticize about improv is that you couldn't replicate that same thing. I mean, if you were and have it be funny again, because that it's scripted and no matter how good of an actor you are or an actress that you are on, on stage, there doing a, um, you know, some game of some Mm -hmm. sort where it's okay. Let's pretend all of us have a limp leg and we're all from Milwaukee and we're trying to, 
you know, walk on water like Jesus across the, the lake. So, you know, everybody knows that, okay, we're making that up for the first time, and we're watching that, and it's funny. But if you had to replicate that the next night as a play, uh, it just right. wouldn't be funny because that whole dynamics has been removed from it. True, and, and some go, things yeah. are funny the first time, and then you realize, oh, it was only funny because mm-hmm. we came up with it. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should tweak that. Right, exactly, and that's why I, I, I mean, I always get in huge arguments with improv actors because they all think that it's an art form, and I, I think it's just an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and what about magic? You've got some magic tricks in the show. Have you always kind of dabbled in magic? Yeah, as a, as a youth, I mean, there's a lot of people in the, in show business that you know will start out with that. Um, and when I was opening for rock and roll bands, I did kind of a. Um, it was, I guess, a, a carrot top magic act. You know, lots of props. And they were magic tricks that worked, that didn't work. But you've got to go back, I'm talking about in the 70s, where the audience uh, at a rock concert, and this is before it started getting he- to be heavy metal, where it was just, you couldn't do anything. But, but a rock concert back then, everybody's stoned. So it's not really hard to do a magic trick. Right. <laughs> I mean, you could just tell them you're doing a magic trick, and they'll believe you. Um, so I... That was kind of a ruse to, I would do a magic trick, then I'd get off and do some comedy, and then when, obviously when the jokes didn't work, I'd go back and pull out another magic trick out of the box. Um, and it worked pretty well, and kind of got my, because at that time, there were no comedy clubs. There wasn't anywhere to, to try, try out stuff in a safe environment. You just got thrown out and on stage in front of, you know, a thousand people, and you either made it or you didn't. Um, so, but those little things that I used to do back then, I kind of pulled them out for this show, The Book of Moron, because it is about, you know, using critical thought. It is about trying to understand the difference between truth and illusion. It is trying to figure about, you know, how do you, what are the two different ways of of looking at this, where they're both valid and they're both invalid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, magic's kind of an interesting way to, you know, as a metaphor uh, to, have those points resonate. I actually was really surprised, and this was one of my questions I was going to ask, but I did not know mm-hmm. that comedy clubs were not always a thing. You know, they, they used to not be television. Well, <laughs> I knew that, <laughs> but I've been going to comedy clubs ever since I became of legal drinking age and, you know, just right, kind of figured right. they were always there. So yeah, to, yeah, to you hear would think rock so. bands no. is... There was nowhere to go. Wow. I mean, you know, you look back even before my era... When you have, you know, guys like the Smothers Brothers, Steve Martin and that, I mean, they were, it's almost kind of come full circle. There were these kind of coffee shops that were the hip um, kind of beatnik era era, uh, remnants. Um, There's a show on, I think on Amazon called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I don't know if you've watched it, but it kind of reflects that period of time where there are all these kind of, you know, hip clubs and the Lenny Bruce type of thing and the Carlin thing where you would go, but it wasn't an existing comedy club. It's, you know, you were sharing the stage with Peter, Paul, and Mary. You were sharing the stage with, you know, Dylan, I would imagine, back then, um, and poets. Leonard Skinner was a band that you uh, opened up for, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I used (laughs) to open for a lot. I, I grew up in the South. So I ran into a guy who owned a record company who handled all the Allman Brothers, Leonard Skinner, all these guys. Um, and this is in very nascent in their careers. So it was easier to hire a comedian who had his own Ford Econoline line van okay. to drive around. <laughs> follow him around. Instead of, a, instead of a whole, you know, four or five piece band that wasn't quite together. Right. And, you know, you got to understand, too, back then... It wasn't that crazy. It was a outlet for people to go and see something that they could not see. We only had three stations on television. There was no cable. Mm-hmm. You know, we had to sit there and watch Ed Sullivan and, you know, all these kind of uh, older generation performances. I mean, that's why, the you know, any time Sullivan put a rock band on his show, it just blew up because, you know, it's, everybody had, that was an, an outlet for what they wanted to see. So they would come and see these shows, and it was every was kind of the Wild West because people would just find a warehouse or somewhere to put people up and um, uh, to put a show on. There were no laws. There were, right. You didn't need insurance, you know, blah, blah, blah. Forget but security. People actually we'll came care, and would yeah. sit and pay attention. So it was, it was interesting. Huh. Times have 
Definitely changed. Yeah. And now you've got so many comedy clubs. Right. You know, it's, I, it, regrettably, it's gotten kind of watered down. So um, I would not want to try to start at this time of the century because I don't know where you can practice and, and work your material out. Well, I mostly do. have comedians performing for other comedians, and that's the worst audience in the world to have. Uh, well, I, I've kind of liked your progression of starting. Well, I mean, you've been on TV for a long time as well, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But mm-hmm. the fact that you went from stand up to these more scripted, uh, almost like, you know, shows yes. in a theater setting is, is pretty awesome. Will, would you, do you ever go back to comedy clubs on occasion? Oh, I. Yes, on occasion I do, and I'll step in. It's, it's when I'm trying to work out some new material for a new show. Okay. Because, uh, I mean, as you'll see these shows that I do, they're, like you were saying, and you're very observant, that they're scripted, and they really, they will change a little bit with current events, but you can't be too current because, I mean, that's what late night television is for. Sure. You know, the guys, guys like um, uh, Colbert and, and Seth Meyers, and, you know, I mean, they're at the top of their game, and... Uh, and even the Comedy Central stuff, because you have enough stuff to to perform, make jokes about, but then it's gone. So if I'm going to do a show, if I'm going to do a joke about politics, it's really not going to be a Stormy Daniels Trump joke. It's going to be something more about our, the zeitgeist of why do we allow this to uh, you know uh, purvey our judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but so the stuff is scripted in a way. But you know, when I the way I came about it wasn't. It wasn't that methodical. I mean, I was doing stand-up. I was also writing for some television shows. I was also an actor on a soap opera uh, in New York. And at the end of that, they all kind of coalesced together. And I says, well, why don't I just write and do my own stuff instead of trying to be this actor for hire? Because you know, the show business has got a very small margin of people that are on the A-list. Oh, right. And when you, you know, so most of, and I even, I have really still really good friends who are, you know, the minute they do a show, a film, or a television show, they're out of work. They got to get another gig. They got to hustle so and it, find it, yeah, something else. Yeah. yeah. So you've written these successful shows. The Book of Moron is the mm-hmm. one that you're on tour right now through. It looks like dates in May, which we've promoted at the yeah. beginning of the show, and we'll talk about getting tickets and stuff at the end. But then yeah, also, I think if you use the word comedy uh, when you go online, that's a code word, and you can get like half price tickets. Ooh. And if you can't spell comedy, well, it is called the Book of Moron. So. <laughs> Now, are you touring in Hungary later on, Budapest? And well, Istanbul? no, I'm not, but the show is. The show uh, is, okay. The show okay. has been done, m- not this show. Cause this no, show we're talking now about the male intellect and oxymoron. Male intellect. Yep, because I'm looking at your website. You've got dates uh, in, through 2018 in, in those. That's why I was wondering if you were doing it, and I'm like, do you know Hungarian as a language? <laughs> there's all these questions that were popping up. Now, with the male intellect, it's a show about men and women, so it's a universal theme. So I've had it's been I think it's being it's being done in Hungary and in also uh, it's going to be done in Turkey, not too in the upcoming future. But it's been done. It's I think it's being done in Sweden as well. It's been done in almost every language uh, except Asian. Okay. Uh, but um, not that they don't have the same problems we have, but um, just haven't been able to get anybody interested in I guess doing it. But it's, uh, they hire their own actors. Um, there's been a lot of success in Europe with American theater and American shows. And, you know, it's, I'm not going to learn, I'm not, I'd have to memorize a whole new language. So you just, somebody translates it and they uh, put it up and it usually uh, sticks and does well. So That's it's, very it's different cool. over there because they'll run the same show. I mean, I think it's been going on in Hungary for almost four or five years. Is, but they don't do it every night. They do it once a month. Is right? this so like a knows. normal thing that, I, I mean, is this like a highly successful thing that you found that, wow, I was able to get my show, you know, put on by other people? And I mean, that's an amazing way to create revenue. But it's, Yeah, it's, my, it's a happen? version of uh, reruns. You know, it's a version yeah. of getting residual checks. Does that I mean, happen like, often you know, to other shows and comedians? I mean, I, I don't know how um, common that Well, is. not with comedians because, you know, like I say, it has to be a show. It can't really just be this, you know, long monologue of stand-up. I mean, I doubt even if you um, look back uh, like the Spalding Gray stuff, I doubt that you could ever really translate that. I mean, this is uh, – and there have been a few that have worked 
uh, over in Europe. It seems to be more of the relationship type of shows because that is a universal topic. For sure. Um, I've, I've had some people interested in the Book of Moron, but like I said, it's, got a, it's a bit of a slice of Americana, but not really because as we're seeing, the entire world is polarized now with you know nationalism versus populism versus you know conservatism versus liberalism it's you know right but yeah you're right relationships is a common thing everybody can relate to yeah yeah so when i was uh just going to grade school you were already on television you were on i guess so oh mm-hmm. yeah i found clips i've saw i've seen the young <laughs> robert out there okay found a clip from 19- yeah. 1985, you, uh, you were on Dick Clark's nighttime show, which I didn't oh, even God, know was a right. thing. Yeah. But you know what? This is funny. Not only did I think that some of those jokes could stand up today, uh, but Dick yeah. Clark spoke really highly of you. So were you on his show multiple times, or did you have a relationship with Dick Clark uh, You know, where you were doing things with him? It's the glory often? of television. You know, you um, everybody believes it. That's the biggest... Um, I, no, I didn't hang out with him. I didn't know anything. In fact, um, I had a very... He was very acute to know that you television was something that was a friendly uh, resource, and you wanted people to be engaged and to think that everybody's in on the secret. So, you know, that was all. I was, to be honest, when I saw that, that was resurrected. I know the clip you're talking about. Yeah. I was even blow, blown away because I... Because I thought, wow, maybe I, I knew him and I forgot that I knew him. <laughs> he was certainly talking very well like we did. were best friends. Yeah. You know, when you do well on a show, then yes, it, it comes back and you start, you know, having more of an acquaintance with that person. Um, so, but it's nothing like we would go out and have lunch. Right, right, okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just checking. You and, know, you know, but he, he was is much really good at, too, at, so. at making you feel... You know, just the way he hosted that show, even from that clip, and but even when he was doing the the New Year's Eve stuff, I mean, it, it was always well, very well, personal. You know, you I mean, have to realize he, it was that. before you were born that he was doing you know the the dance shows, right? Um, and he just had this kind of you know vulnerability that people liked. Now, you if you go into the history of Dick Clark, you'll find that he had a duality to him as well. There was there was a very mean streak in the guy, so hmm. um, you know. But show business is littered with all these casualties. And, um, because, you know, all we see is that screen, and, I mean, it's become a religion. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's sacrilegious to, to actually show somebody's true faults right. that has been on TV. So. Well, yeah, and nobody wants to talk about them either. Um, no, but you can elect them for president. <laughs> <laughs> now, educate me a little bit here. I'm sure the goal of being on TV during that time, especially like the eighties was to increase your popularity, mm-hmm. selling out your shows, getting people to go see you, but you weren't really promoting, you know, comedy through DVDs, downloadable audio tracks like today. Well, they didn't, they didn't exist. Exactly. So that leads to my question. Was there something else you got besides selling maybe tickets in the future off of a television appearance? I mean, was there something that I'm no, not thinking just of? This false idea of value and fame. I mean, there are people who really think it gave them a validation. Um, you, it, it did not sell tickets. It did not uh, do anything. You know, I mean, maybe if you got really famous, it would, you could, you know, work Vegas. But the whole idea of doing concerts um, for comedians, you know, unless you were Carlin or, or something that didn't exist until the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, you know, it was... The f- it's interesting the fact that you, you, you're, some of the stuff shows up on YouTube because it's all about content, how much stuff we can get, so we, they just pull everything out of the trash bin and throw it up there. <laughs> um, and but back then, you know, it was on and then it was gone. Right. We didn't even have tape machines. Uh-huh. I mean, it's re- it's absurd that there was, you know, and like I said, there were. I mean, I I joke about you know the reason why we invented cable was because men were losing control of, of the world. You know, women were taking their jobs and burning their bras. So they invented cable. So they have a remote control so they could control something. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, and now it's just, we're just bombarded with content. Yeah. Um, which leads to what the book of morons all about. You know, we're, you know, you have to decipher the difference between, <laughs> truth and illusion. I mean, we have congressmen who actually are in favor of waterboarding and torture because it worked for Jack Bauer. They say that on the floor of Congress. Wow. And they're, they're 
referencing a fictional yeah, a I mean, scripted look, well, we got a, show. Geez, we got we got a president who's a, who's a reality TV, you know, uh, personality. Uh-huh. You now, uh, you got to work with another legend a couple of times, Alan Thick. Mm-hmm. You were on a short-lived mm-hmm. 80s talk show, mm-hmm. The Thick of the Night. And then later mm-hmm. on, you appeared on Growing Pains as a result. Um, so was the Growing Pains thing because you were on Alan's show earlier and he remembered no, you? Or? I don't think so. I mean, that's, you know, those two didn't intersect. Like they're, everything's, uh, plat- The platforms are cross-promoting nowadays. But the first time that happened, it was an idea I had and another actor had when we were on a soap opera. I was on a, a show called Loving, and he was on a show called All My Children. And we both played these kind of detective spy cop guys who had relationships with, you know, I mean, it was a soap opera. You were, you know, sleeping with everybody. So, uh, but what we did, and we talked to the people at ABC, and we says, why don't you let me cross over into Pine Valley and have James cross over into Corinth, those were the fictional cities, okay. to investigate shows and investigate, um, you know, uh, uh, storylines and crimes in order to get the people who are watching one show to stick around and watch the next show. And um, they told us it was the most ridiculous idea they ever heard. What? But then, six months later, we see that it's in our script. Well, obviously, they didn't want us. They didn't want to pay us want... for the storyline idea. Sure. I mean, you know, that's how business works. But it, it did, we did end up doing that. And, but that was just a, a no-no. I mean, you know. Look, you, you have to understand the soap operas were the, the precursor to this cliffhanger uh, anthology binge-watching that we'd watch now. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we, except it was done through the course of a week. We started the storyline on a Monday. On Friday, the storyline would change and leave a cliffhanger. And then you'd bring it back up the next Monday and you repeat it all the way to the next Friday with another cliffhanger. Whereas now, you know, you just write 13 episodes and it's, I mean, the the acting and the storylines are much more powerful. But that was, Jesus, back when I, you know, it was, I mean, I hate to say this kind of old school kind of talking because I don't, think of myself as that but you just realize what the parameters were and what you uh, were locked into so i mean the the i mean i had done done uh, a series called um um geez what's what was the gary coleman series i was on oh different show. strokes different right? strokes mm-hmm. i did different yep. strokes for a while and i was i was the boyfriend of dana plato and they were going to spin off her own little you know show which was a young couple but you know obviously she had problems and over the summer they canned that um, and, but then I was picked up to do some stuff on Alan's show. Um, but that was a whole different, you know, those were all chops that were deserving because of your, your acting ability. It had nothing to do with doing stand-up. Okay. I, I mean, back then, stand-up and acting were, you know, they were two different fields. And you, uh, right when we all started getting our own sitcoms, uh, some stuck and some didn't. I mean, my I did two pilots that never went anywhere, but, you know, Roseanne and Tim Allen and Jerry Seinfeld, theirs went through the roof. So, you know, but that's when you started getting comedians to be actors. And there's always a questionability as to how good they are at acting. So, How long would you, like, pitch a pilot for? Would you try it multiple seasons, or was it kind of a, a oh, one-and-done I mean, type back situation? Then it's, you know, it, the network was, would order about 50 of them, and they only had slots for three or four. And it was really just a way to spend money. Mm. Um, I mean, you, some of them never saw the light of day. Right. And actually, I mean, there, there is, you know, with, with Seinfeld's show, I mean, it sat on a shelf. And the only reason why it was put on the air was because Ted Danson with Cheers was negotiating a hard deal and wouldn't do the show. And they had, a, a, they had, a they had 30 minutes they had to fill for a month. So they took Jerry's show off the uh, shelf and put it on there. And obviously, you know, William Goldman wrote a, wrote a great book about, uh, you know, adventures in the screen trade. And you basically dial it down to nobody in show business knows what they're doing. They all say they do, but then nobody does. And they still don't. It's just whatever happens, happens, and it works. It works. It's just how do you get it out there in front of people? Sure. Huh. Same way with music, I'm sure. If your acting career would have really taken off, do you think that you would have – stuck with this love of comedy and, and done this or I know, think would this so. always I be think a side I, you know, it's, what's fortunate is that whether it took off or, or I think I would have always had the 
slot to be able to do this kind of thing. I mean, you see guys that are well known now that are doing it. John Lithgow, Billy Crystal, you know, even Bette Midler is doing, you know, they cut out a swath of three or four months into a show. Right. Um, but it is a very fulfilling and rewarding. They're very difficult to do, but once you do them, it's really a, a blast. I mean, it's, you know, nothing compares, you know, a movie, you, you, you talk for 30 seconds <laughs> and then you got to sit down and wait and they got to relight things. And it's, um, it's laborious. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it sure it looks glamorous, but, uh, I mean, even this form that we're doing now with the podcast, yeah. that went away for so long. I mean, I just, before I called you, I did two, uh, interviews for two radio stations in Mount Vernon, Oregon. And, you know, it's a quick three and a half, five minutes, and that's it. And you're in and out, and you got to hit them with punchlines. you got to, you know, kind of sell what it is you're selling. Really quickly, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's swipe left, swipe right. You know, it's, I mean, the long form is interesting that because there are people who still need that understanding of, you know, just pulling out the sound bites leaves a lot of information out. And that's why we've loved this podcast and, and people listen because we're able to really get in depth on some of their, their stars that they're watching in movies and television and uh, mm-hmm. going to see. And I think that that's kind of a special thing that we've been able to, to bring, um, which yeah. is why well, people like you, I'm glad you. you came on. Is there a particular TV show today that you would think, man, I'd love to do a guest spot on that show? A lot of the anthologies and the stuff that you see um, – I would like to, whether it's Homeland or House of Cards. Or I guess they're looking for a new actor for that, aren't they? <laughs> I guess they are. Um, I, not so much with the comedies, um, because, to be honest, they're, to me, and the kind of comedy that I do, it's more long form. I mean, my shows are like your podcast. I mean, you really have to kind of sit there and get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts out... To me, when you see a half-hour comedy, which is really only 23 minutes when you take all the commercials and everything in and out of it, um, it's really at one level. It's kind of like when I was doing the soap opera. We had some actors that were just phenomenal, and then we had some that were just, you know, walking stick figure, good-looking people. And But everybody looked. At, everybody could, like, get to a level of 6 out of 10. So the, the the actors who were as good as a scale of ten, as good as you get, the Meryl Streeps of the of the world, they would always come off looking like a six, and you know the, the Victoria's Secret models right. that had a walk on, you know they would issue a couple of lines, and you know they came off as a six. So it's I think, and that's the same thing with a lot of the three camera sitcoms. It's you know, if you close your eyes or you just read the script, it's not its not that funny, but, you know, it's part of the genre. It's part of the, you know, and I, that's not something I'd be that interested in anymore. But, okay. Um, I would rather make something serious funny instead of something funny funny. Okay. Now, I found it fascinating. You have never actually had a real job. Comedy's kind of been your only job. And do you consider, Yeah, show business, you're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. do you consider yourself lucky in that respect, or do you feel like maybe you're do. missing out on the everyday human experience? <laughs> No, I, you know, there's some toil involved in this, um, but uh, no, I do consider myself pretty lucky. I mean, I've been able to pursue something that I like doing because, look, even if I wasn't getting paid for this, I'd probably do it. I like that. Now, does your wife work? Uh, or I know she's traveled with you in the past, but does she mm-hmm. have a real job? Um, she is like me. She's been able to make a success out of She was a, a real successful commercial and actress at her, in her day, and okay. now she's a writer. Um, she's working on a documentary uh, about the opioid crisis in uh, the Midwest. Um, she's tackling some serious issues, and I try to make her laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, especially when you're dealing with serious yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, so she's been fortunate to to do the same thing. Um, and I know that's, I mean, I feel for people who are stuck in positions they don't like to be in, but I also think no matter how bad the situation is, you can find some facet of it that keeps you interested instead of just becoming a drone. But, you know, that's just my own personal ideology, I guess. You've not only written your own shows, but you've written shows mm-hmm. for other performers. Dave Shirley's mentioned on your website with a show called Oddville. Uh, mm-hmm. I do some writing as well, and usually I write based on an event that inspires the idea. So is that mm-hmm. the same way that you come up with your material, or do you make yourself sit down and brainstorm content? Both. Um, I, uh, 
I've always kind of gone around, and I don't know if it's some sort of um, ADD of some sort that I have or some sort of problem processing. Um, I seem to do things in reverse. Um, I will come up with, like in the Book of Moron, there's a couple of pieces that were, they really stand out as individual pieces. They would work like as a sketch. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like Saturday Night Live does a sketch of the Wayne's World and it ends up being a movie. So they figure out how to expand it out. I end up getting all these little kind of ideas that are all funny, and I post them on a wall, and I try to figure out, figure out what the thread is that connects them, because I had to, you know, from a creative point of view, I had to come up with them somehow, so there's something subliminal that's telling me that this needs to be expressed a certain way. Mm-hmm. But I've got to pull myself out of it and then try to find the through line after it's kind of all been you know, written. So what it is, is I will overwrite, I'll write three hours of stuff from different sections at different times of, of, you know, the year or the the day, and then figure out what was the impetus that brought them all together. I mean, the whole idea with the Book of Moron is about a guy who loses his memory. And the stage represents the inside of his brain. He's in a coma. And he has all these voices that talk to him, his inner, his inner, uh, his inner moron, his <laughs> voice of reason, his common sense, his um, inner child. Okay. Um, and, what, and so he has to, so he doesn't even know what the truth is. He's forgotten. So he has to use this critical thought and these inner voices in order to wake up out of his coma in order to figure out who he is. So it, that's a, you know, it's a very kind of heavy-handed message, but... I didn't realize that until uh, this idea of memory loss and this idea of, you know, what, until I started looking at all these little bits that I had written and right. all these uh, sections. And there are certain things that I can say in my voice that I, certain things that I can't say in my voice that I have to use a character for because it's either too offensive or too abrasive or it or it's doesn't make any sense coming out of my mouth. Sure. So that's the reason that you have all the different characters in the shows. They're really as a pulpit to speak their ideology that, you know, doesn't agree with the main character. Or delivering jokes in a more funny way. Well, exactly, sure. You know, with an accent, with a limp, with exactly. a, you know, I mean, it, being more animated. So you've already started writing your next show. This title mm-hmm. is called Stand Up Jesus. Uh, you want to talk right. a little bit about the show and when you might expect that to be ready for performance? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's part of what I try to, I try to kind of get ahead of the curve in writing this stuff. It was interesting with the Book of Moron, I wrote it, and it was kind of ready before the election of 2016. It was almost like immediately after the election, it went through the roof. It was something that people were going, oh, you know, didn't didn't realize how we missed uh-huh. the, uh, the vision on this, um, and I think it'll be timely for another decade. Um, the, it's tough making fun of religion. I mean, people. I mean, you think Republicans and Democrats have a hard time meeting <laughs> minds? <Yeah. laughs> get into their <laughs> get into their conspiracy theories on you know how they believe the world was created, and <clears throat> you know you might as well be talking to yourself. Uh, So it's really difficult trying to figure out the premise of this. Um, I've got a lot of material. I don't know when it'll happen. I'm kind of thinking of maybe creating the idea of stand-up Jesus that Jesus comes back to take over dad's business because, you know, dad's getting Alzheimer's. And, um, you know, you show examples of that uh, with history. And he... uh, then has to explain to everybody that they got the whole message wrong. You know, you uh-huh. turn it upside down, inside out. It's, it's a preachy type of performance, so I'm trying to think of maybe staging it as a, because uh, Jesus does say, you know, it's, I, it's taken him so long to come back because he's been rewriting the Bible, he's adding punchlines, because he realized the last time he was here, if you preach without punchlines, you get crucified. So he has to add punchlines to the Bible and all his teachings. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe you make the show like a comedy club where you have three acts, Mm -hmm. and the first act is the Holy Ghost, the second act is Jesus, and the third act is God. But it's still the same. It's me being all three characters. Right. So, but it's it's still a long way, because it's tough excoriating the deities that we believe in. And you want to make sure it's ready 
before. That's true, too. And to be honest, it probably won't ever play in the South. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah. Uh, certain areas, you know, maybe. Okay. Well, let's end this interview, uh, our conversation today, with some questions our fans really love to hear the answers to. So Mm -hmm. we always highlight the various encounters a performer has with their fans. And so Mm -hmm. we we love hearing uh, these stories from the star's side of the situation. So do you have any fan encounters that stick out to you as memorable ones you won't forget? Sure. Uh, A couple. A lot of them stem out from the previous show that I'd done. Um, A few things. One we touched on earlier. I mean, I had one old, in Chicago, an old guy fall out of his chair. He was laughing so hard. He was having a heart attack. And we had to stop the show and get the medics to come in. And he's white as a sheet, and he's still chuckling, laying down on the ground. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the guy's on death's door. He's having a blast. Um, so that made it easy to work with. <laughs> did he survive? Do you know? <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, yeah. thank yeah. goodness. You know, he's, I mean, I didn't. I killed, but not literally. Right, basically. good. Thank you. Put it that yeah. way, right. Yeah. Um, and the other that was really touching was, that, like I was explaining to you earlier, the last show that I wrote, uh, The Male Intellect and Oxymoron, I had a couple of things. I'd have people come who had saw it while they're dating, mm-hmm. and then they'd come back when I'd come back four or five years, and they were married. And then they'd come back, you know, with their kids now, because the show's about 20 years old, bringing them to the show. Um, and I says, well, I hope this doesn't lead to divorce because I don't want you guys to come back, you know, separately. You have to start this whole thing all over again. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's one thing that's very touching that, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, there are people who, you know, they've got copies of the DVD and they show it to everybody on there, you know, who comes and they spread it around. That's, that's interesting. But I had this one uh, woman, she wanted to propose to her boyfriend okay. instead of waiting for him to propose to her. So she... I worked it in in the show that I would bring her up on stage and bring him up on stage, ask him questions about, you know, it was after the show, did he learn anything? And, okay. And it was a real kind of touchy moment because it was like most of us try to think of something memorable to, to remember what our engagements are. Or, and I think this is something that, you know, she, she proposed to the guy. She got on her knee and asked the guy to marry her wow. with a ring on stage. And, of course, he said yes and... You know, any schmuck would have to say yes. Oh, you better. <laughs> You're not going to be able to walk out of there. Um, and I think they're still very happily married. So it's, that was, you know, one of those uh, true moments that was nice, a nice memory to have. How did she contact you? Like before, did she send you a, like an email or something? Yeah, or? I mean, she would. She sent me a letter, and I mean, well, I think that was through an email okay. because you can get a hold of me through my website. So, and she, you know, said I have this idea. And huh. I, and I says, well, uh, let's make it work. That's cool. I said, let's just, let's just, I said, are you sure he's going to say yes? I don't want to, you know, because then I'm going to have to marry you. You know, <laughs> we're going to have to have some, you're going to have, somebody's going to have to say yes to this. Sure. So your website is robertduback.com and mm-hmm. uh, you can get the link there for the DVD if you want to buy the male intellect. It's available on Amazon. Right. And we are releasing it. We're getting, I'm waiting for the shipment to arrive. For, we have DVDs of the Book of Moron now. So that'll be uh, on the website as well. Awesome. Uh, but I'd rather everybody in Milwaukee come out and see it live. Yes, it's absolutely. Always, it's always better live. And, and not He's just got, Milwaukee, because after that, you've got yes. still a full schedule. Tampa, Nashville. I usually take the summers off, and I start back up. I don't think I have the website up, but we already have stuff for next fall. Uh, back in Portland, uh, San Rafael, St. Louis, lots of places. <laughs> All right, Robert Duback, thank you so much for joining us on Fan Counters. Really enjoyed the interview. And, uh, You're welcome. Good luck on the rest of the tour. (laughs) All right, Nick. All right, take care. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Robert Duback for joining us this week on Fan Counters. That was a really good look back at, you know, it's always interesting before the internet, before streaming and all this stuff, uh, what it was really like to start out as an entertainer. Some people think it was easier uh, back then versus now, and it probably was to get noticed. Uh, but uh, those stories are always interesting to me so I hope you enjoy those as well Uh, you can go to Robert Duback's website for tickets to his show The Book of Moron and as we mentioned he's in San Jose this weekend Uh, next week he'll head to Sarasota, Florida Charlotte, North Carolina of course uh, April 13th and 14th he's in Milwaukee May 5th in Nashville and May 18th and 19th in Tampa 
You can go to his website, robertduback.com, to get tickets and enter the code word COMEDY to get two tickets for the price of one. You can join us on our website, which is fancounters.com. You can catch up on all of our episodes there. The other thing I want to mention is we did launch a Twitter page for the show. We've had a um, fantastic response to our Facebook group, and we're hoping that you'll also join us on Twitter if you search for Fan Counters Live. We're also on Instagram at Fan Counters Live, and we'll post some uh, pictures there. And uh, we would love to have you join our community. And lastly, if you share our show with your friends, we greatly appreciate it. It helps get... Uh, all of our guests' messages and stories out to the world. And certainly we appreciate all those shares as well. So next week, join us for a awesome guest. If you've seen the show House Hunters, if you remember the first 10 years of the show, because the show's been going on almost 20 years, but the first 10 years of the show, they had a host, and her name was Suzanne Wong. And she's going to join us next week on Fan Counters to talk about House Hunters, and also a very uh, moving, inspirational story about her battle with cancer. So until next week, keep sharing our episodes and uh, we'll be back next Friday.